Hey everyone, and welcome to ESI Digital Summer. My name is Cody Luongo. I'm a journalist for Esports Insider, and thanks for joining us at, at our panel today in this session, in a special session indeed. I'm joined here with um, Wim Stocks, who's the SVP of Partnerships and Commercial at Belong Gaming Arenas, and uh, also the person with probably, arguably, the best hair in the esports industry. Um, so, Wim, <laughs> it's uh, nice to have you. <laughs> How you doing? Thank Cody. Nice, nice to be here. Thank you. And thanks to uh, ESI for uh, for bringing us on. This is this is a fun. This will be a fun discussion. Yeah, no sweat. So, um, yeah, thanks again for everyone that's, that's joining us today. So today we're talking about local and grassroots esports and the ecosystem um, sort of at large. You know, there's a lot of interesting things that are happening right right now in the industry with uh, certainly the pandemic's still happening, but winding down a lot of activity in terms of um, in-person venues popping up and belong certainly certainly leading the charge there in the in the U.S. now um, under the Vindex brand. Um, you know, so no real better individual and, and uh, representative from a company to, to speak on this. And, and again, belong that's integrating teams, brands, stakeholders in games so tightly within communities around the world and sort of why it's such a crucial part of the industry. Um, and, uh, yeah, again, no, no better person to speak on that. And I think Wim, it would be, it would be great to hear from you a little bit on your background and, and who you are and why your word has some weight in this sort of sector. <laughs> well, I, I've, I've been, uh, involved in the gaming business for over 30 years from largely from the publishing side of things. So the business side, sales, marketing, distribution, licensing, um, supply chain, uh, you you name it. From a from a business perspective, I've I've been involved uh, in it, and really the last twelve years um, have been uh, deeply involved, immersed um, completely in competitive gaming. When when we started our company, World Gaming, um, twelve years ago, um, there there wasn't a word for competitive video gaming. It was um, uh, it was it was just uh, we you wanted to, to show up and play in a in a competition or a tournament and and it wasn't until I think 2013 esports uh, the word came along so um, we had uh, in in a, in my realm as as and we we're gonna I know we're gonna dive into uh, structure here but but Vindex um, is the is the owner uh, the acquirer of Belong Belong started in the UK. Um, uh, over over four years ago, um, but as Vindex bought Belong, obviously Mike Mike everybody knows Mike Sepso and Tundes Di Giovanni. As we were building World Gaming um, back starting in 2009, um, they were built they were building and had already launched uh, MLG, and we we were often confused um, as competitors when. We really weren't. We were what we were all about was exactly what we're going to be talking about here: the amateur um, infrastructure and the developmental opportunities for players who who were aspiring to be competitive, to actually show their chops. And World Gaming was was really on the ground floor, m more on the amateur side than an MLG was always about the the professional side, the the high end, the elite players. Uh, and ours was 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 really the mantra was building funnels and giving players the opportunity to to uh, show their stuff and and to get better. So so in now as as part of my my new realm starting uh, with with Belong and Findex last uh, last winter, um, I've I've now gotten into not just the digital facets of of providing uh, funnels for for gamers, but also now physical with the uh, the arenas that we're building, um, just getting just getting started in the in the in the U.S. As I mentioned, uh, um, the the belong arenas were were born out of the retailer game in the U.K. experiential land and 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 game marketing uh, centers that um, uh, are, are been up and operating as I said for three or four years. Um, uh, did it had to had to go dark during the pandemic as as most live uh, venues did, but. Now back up and operating, and at the same time we're we're building our footprint, starting our rollout of uh, arenas. There'll be over 300 of these arenas. Uh, very ambitious plan. Um, over 300 of these arenas over the course of the next uh, four to four to five years. Uh, so so and and all of uh, this infrastructure is really to to 
build what is so missing and so lacking in 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 gaming esports these these opportunities for uh, players not only to convene and commune um, in a in a physical way, um, but also providing all the support for um, uh, skills development, for strategy development, for aspirational play that can that can provide paths to those elite levels. All wholly missing um, in esports. We we did some of it um, at World Gaming and and the collegiate division. We had CSL. But that was a really largely digital, and and we we think not only can we bring that digital presence for um, for funnel building and amateur uh, play development, but the physical uh, aspect of being in a community, really down to a neighborhood level, um, is what has been so missing in in esports and and gaming, and and that's that's essentially the the premise um, and the mission we're on to uh, to to build that and to bring more opportunities to, to players and to, to local activations as a result. That's a fantastic overview, Wim. I think you probably covered anything, everything I, I put together in this prep document for us to, to <laughs> have some content and questions to go over. I also want to point out, I think it's interesting when um, you can use the, uh, you can say that I was in the industry before esports was even a, a coin term, right? I was like, that's an interesting benchmark for um, sort of setting up the timeline and things. But um, yeah, definitely in an in, in interesting area right now. And um, again, you mentioned like Collegiate Star League, and this is an area that you've been working in and sort of playing a key role in those competitive opportunities at the local and, and uh, amateur level and building those aspirational sort of pipelines for those players in North America, now globally over Belong. Um, I think, you know, again, it, it'd be it'd be really helpful context just to get a little more linear when and, and, and as we go through these conversations and, of course, talking about Belong right now. So for the, for the people that don't know, what is Belong Gaming Arenas and what sort of uh, what purpose is it is it fulfilling in the industry? It's a great question, uh, Cody. Um, so so Belong, as I mentioned, are we started in the in the UK, 25 of these already up and operating really meant to bring a local presence to esports as, as anybody who's been following esports knows that esports got a lot of momentum um, in the early days at the sort of the top of the of the heap the um, the pro levels um, people were marveling at uh, the fact that um, these players were, were so skilled were um, uh, now competing in competitions that looked an awful lot like traditional sports, save the fact that there was a different game involved. Um, the, the, the infrastructure or the, or the pro support that was coming, the, the notion of these ninja at the top of the heap and, and Tifu and others um, really um, bringing presence to esports as, as the, the new sort of, the sort of contemporary athleticism that um, Traditional sports, but obviously very well established in, in traditional sports, but um, not doesn't didn't exist in in uh, in amateur sports. So the belong gaming arena is building that community presence instead of being at the macro level, being right down in the community. Um, uh, you know, not only not only from a physical presence, but when I also as a community of a building community for for a game for a particular game for gamers playing a particular game. Um, that the combination of uh, digital presence as well as the physical presence in the arenas are a big part of how that local activation happens. And it, we, we, in my my past uh, in the collegiate realm, collegiate um, has done a lot to also engender um, more local and and regional sorts of activations, more regional and local presence for esports that has really um, uh, stepped up what what the infrastructure for for um, esports is all about what's been missing what's been lacking these macro level pro teams that were in the early days very nomadic um with the they you know you pick up and go to a counter-strike uh, event in in um Katowice, uh, poland uh that would would uh bring in teams from all over the planet but but not didn't really do much to to build a, a, a community from where that that particular team might have been. So, so we we have seen you know the advent of as as the pro layers have been built, the pro layers have distinguished themselves. Um, the need for funnels, the need for 
um, ladders for players and, and also the need for local activations to bring um, more accessibility to, to gaming, more accessibility to, to events and tournaments, um, and, and also the more accessibility to, to gameplay, to skills building, to strategy building uh, that can be um, uh, encompassed in a, not only a, a physical arena like Belong, but, um, but also um, digitally through uh, the platform that we're building that will knit all of, our, of, all, all of these uh, um, experiential gaming uh, centers and land, land facilities together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I, again, I find um, that these are all belong, are, are all connected locations, right? So it's not just that Correct. you have the uh, Pearland location as this standalone venue, right? It's connected by this platform that's also um, where these people can play against the London Lionhearts at that UK destination and each complete with their own sort of local hometown amateur esports team. And to me, that's that's the coolest thing, because if when, when I was, you know, big into playing games at 12, 13, 14, I couldn't imagine having uh, a place that I could go and compete on as I would like my local recreational soccer team. Right. I think that's such a cool element of, of what Belong has to offer. Well, you, you said two great things there, Cody, number one of which is you mentioned Pearland for those on the, on the uh, Zoom here who don't, don't, don't know what Pearland is. Pearland's a neighborhood in Houston. Instead of saying we have an arena in Houston, we actually use that, that local neighborhood, um, Pearland, as the, as the moniker um, for that arena. And we're about to open um, our second arena in, in Dallas, but we're not calling it the Dallas Arena. We're calling it the Grapevine. Uh, arena. So this notion of being in a local neighborhood is a really, and in that community, uh, is a really important part of what we stand for. Uh, the the second thing is, as as you mentioned, Cody, I know you've you've seen some of the work we've done to bring that local identity to life. We've done it through in Pearland. We have our own team uh, name for players in that particular arena. It's the the, the Pearland Archers, and meant to be our arch. The archer is a I, I'm not going to remember the I'm not going to remember the background, but the archer is a is a local um, icon in the in the Pearland neighborhood and has some some legacy and history there. So, like I said, I don't I don't remember what the story is, but but uh, all of the logoing, all of the brand building, all the team building that we've done there will carry that that Pearland archers um, uh, brand and and logoing. We get to we get to. Uh, 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 Dallas and the Grapevine community and, and neighborhood, uh, that Grapevine um, uh, location will have as its moniker, as its team, as its logo and brand, uh, the Grapevine Guardians. So so each one of these arenas, you, you mentioned London Lionhearts, that's right downtown London and um, uh, right off Oxford Street, are uh, one of the bigger um, facilities we have in the UK. And every one of these, these, these arenas has its local, its own unique identity and team. And that's really meant to also to to bring affinity to those arenas through through the local community and and I has to help them establish a team an identity a, a, a common common ground a community and and something to to rally around and do and to uh, to um, cheer for as uh, as as part of the uh, as, as part of these rivalries between arenas start to build and take shape yeah that'll be so cool and I'm again I'm thinking back we had a a rival against the a rivalry against uh, the neighboring town next to us, New Milford. And I'm just like sort of fantasizing yeah. about what that could have been like as a kid. And I, I'm hoping you guys build a, an arena here in Stanford. We're on base soon. Maybe the Stanford Sea Dogs, we can call it. We'll work on the name, but uh, having something like that well, would be amazing. So I like I, I like I like where you're headed with that, Cody. That's a that's a great thought. <laughs> One day I can dream. But one um, day, yeah. So. Putting, following back a bit, you mentioned like, you know, local activations and why it's so important. I think you did cover like a, a, a great deal of, you know, getting a sense of why. Um, but also like there's this value to publishers, teams, brands, stakeholders and, and other people that want to get involved in the industry that now have this physical channel, right, to get involved, right? It's not just like this digital era that we're in and playing online as it had been through the pandemic, but now you have this really cool local sort of angle. Um, so, you know, I, I guess my, my question would be, 
you know, what, what is the value to, to that group, to publishers specifically, teams, brands? This might be like a long-winded response, that, and I'll buckle in for that. But, um, you know, what, what is the value <laughs> to each of those parties with uh, having local activations, and, and why is it Im important to activate in person and locally like that? That's a, a, another great question, and, and we, we, we do think our value proposition is is meaningful and, and significant for the various constituencies you you uh, cited. Um, you know, I'll, I'll start start with publishers. For publishers, we and we have great relationships with with nearly every publisher that that has made a game or is making games um, because they see the value of us exposing their games um, to players if, if, in a either in a brand new launch or um, in a game that's been around for some time. Um, the programming that we offer through the the arenas um, and special bespoke events like community nights or, or uh, bespoke tournaments really help in that discovery um, in reaching um, players who want to want to compete competitively. We're we're not, but we talk an awful lot about the competitive uh, scene and our in our fun, the funnels we're building in the competitive scene, but but just as e equally as important to us are, is social gaming. The fact that that this audience, these millennials and Gen Zs, who are our targets, um, when they're social they're, and they're, with, they're hanging out with their friends, they they play games. They, it's part of their social experience and and part of how they connect and part of how they um, uh, want to interact with one another. So so that this this notion of not only competitive but social is a really important part for us. And that also in, uh, enables and, and really promotes um, uh, discovery of, of, of games and getting more deeply involved in a, a particular game. Uh, where the other you know the other big piece of this um, is in, in it's not it's not um, purely focused on gaming but 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 does it does manifest itself. In our in our realm, but many other categories and product lines as well, and segments as well, is that experiential marketing is a big part of now of the and live experiential marketing is a really important part of how um, uh, product lines, how uh, uh, consumer product lines go to market, and, and the fact that you can a player can walk in, um, find a game, see a game, um, have access to it, have have be able to play it, uh, be able to play with their friends. Um, that's a that's a really important part of uh, the the discovery chain um, as well. And you know, the, just to, to close on that on on this particular segment, I'll move on to the others. But community building is another thing that 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 we do through the arenas, through our programming. Um, it could be a game that's that's seven years or ten years old, um, but yet what we do is we sustain um, players for that game. We build new players for that game. Um, you know, building a community is not an easy thing to do. Um, and what we do through our physical uh, venues, who, through the gaming stations, this, this high-end um, elite performance um, uh, aesthetic and, and experience that we offer through the arenas, it, it does, does enable further uh, community building, getting more people involved in the funnel and keeping them around, keeping them active and, and giving them, giving them uh, reason to, to be part of the community. So. Um, as, as, as I said, it's not easy to build a com community. It, it has to be done the right way and it has to be done uh, authentically. And, and um, we, we, we believe um, we have as authentic of, a, of a, an experience through the arenas as, as can be uh, found in the, on, you know, on the planet. So, um, so that's sort of the publisher value proposition. Um, we also, you know, for the, for the teams, I've, some of this is, has been um, announced in the press, not, not all of it, um, but, but we've, we've, we've announced, a, as we open our Dallas arenas, we've announced a, a big partnership with, with uh, Envy in Dallas. Um, mm -hmm. We announced when we opened Houston, um, we announced a, a, a partnership, a commercial partnership with the Houston Outlaws. These, those pro teams are really important to us. And, and, I'll, I'll dare say that we're important to them because um, number one, we provide them venues for their teams to show up and play for practice facilities, for team events, for viewing parties, watch parties in the arenas when the, when the, when the uh, Dallas fuels out of town, um, come into the, to the Dallas arena, the Grapevine arena and be able to hang out with others cheering on the, the fuel in, a, in an Overwatch um, 
uh, league league match. So so that's the value that we we provide to the teams, but but of equal importance uh, and coming to 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 be benefit of benefit to us are the fact that they are the inspiration for our aspirational targets and. And, you know, we had a Houston Outlaws uh, uh, meet and greet at our opening in Houston three weekends ago, four weekends ago, and uh, big turnout, you know, that people want to see and, 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 and be able to interact with their heroes, these, these Overwatch League uh, players that, that are amongst the best on the, on the, on the planet and, and are really the inspiration for um, our, our targets who are, are more, more getting their chops in order, get, getting their, their skills and their, and their strategy in order. And, and to see that those, those, those players live and in person, that's a really important part of the, of we have. So this two way, this two way value chain that, that uh, us, us to the teams and the teams to us, that's a really important part of, of, of what we, what we try to accomplish in every, not, a, not just in, the large markets, but in every market that we go into. And then for, and for, I think you asked about brands. Brands are really important to us. I think, I think we offer a, a 1 million percent authentic opportunity for a brand to be, to be uh, affiliated with um, uh, this audience, this audience, which is, which is, you know, notably tough to, to, to reach and tough to um, um, engage with the, the fact if you want to, uh, talk to a millennial and Gen Z. There's no better way to do it than through a, a belong arena, through the experiences we offer, through the through the events we offer, through all of the programming in our arenas and, and the asset center arenas. So, so um, this is the, we're 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 clearly if you're looking to to, to target a, a gamer um, with the with the with the desire to spend on gaming again, belong arena. We we feature endemic brands beautifully, but we're also we're deeply involved in a number of non-endemic brands that that are as we build our footprint are expressing a lot of interest in in how they can come to life um, in the arenas and and through an affiliation with with us in the arenas through a through an event through a tournament through um, content uh, uh, other other things along those lines so um, and then for and then really the the final piece and not and really should be should have been the first thing we talked about is the consumers you know what what is our our value proposition for consumers, and I, I stated it you know, kind of lightly, but I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize it here that, that we are offering um, a very high end uh, performance, uh, high performance elite experience through um, the equipment we have in the, um, in the arenas and through the experiences and the, and the program we have in the arenas. Our, our partners, um, and I'll, I'll, I will, We'll never stop uh, thanking them for what they've done. But uh, Omen by HP, we have we have some of the best uh, PCs on the on the planet. Um, we have PS5s, we have Xbox Series Xs, thanks to Sony and Microsoft. Um, we have HyperXs have, as saw the value of of our audiences, um, and so have, have also worked with us on on partnership to make sure that all of our gaming stations are equipped with their their very best uh, equipment. Um, Mavix, our chair partner, um, ViewSonic, our screen monitor partner. Um, th these are these impart um, uh, some of the some of the highest end gaming experiences you could, you, you as a as a player as a consumer can have, and and so that we bend over backwards to make sure our um, our experience is amongst the, the the best on the on the on the planet. So so we 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 do we do are very mindful of and and very. Uh, caring about the the value propositions for all of our constituencies, all maybe a little bit unique, but um, uh, unique from one another, distinct, distinctive from one another, but nonetheless, the uh, we we are serving um, first and foremost the consumer, and and I think the rest follows as a result of a result of that. Yeah, that's that's excellent, Wim. Thanks for such uh, extensive detail on that. I wanted I just stopped myself <laughs> from jumping in at every moment because I wanted to. Like, yes, yeah, yes, this is so brilliant. Um, like few things I just want to run by as I was taking notes while you were talking is like the, for teams, you know, everything you're alluding to is, is really this powerful sort of fan engagement center. Right. And then having that physical presence because esports teams, some of them have, you know, venues and centers that they play, you know, there's offices in there and they play privately, but that's, those aren't open to the public. There isn't a space for them right. to really have that one-on-one -on -one FaceTime with fans that I think, 
you know, is really important. And as you said, build those connections with these players that they idolize and adore and want to be like, um, you know, and then on the consumer point, you know, with especially with these partners like HyperX, Mavix, you know, this is a real interesting angle for me, especially like almost as like through the a retail lens is, um, well, uh, sorry, let me back through the consumer lenses is like the accessibility, right? Um, is, is having that spot and, and that equipment for people to come in and also like through the discovery chain and process, like you said, use this equipment that is quite costly, right? Like a full PC setup is a lot of money, um, but have the ability to use that, that top tier equipment and, and, and experiment it. And that's sort of the retail angle that I was um, sort yeah. of jumped ahead at was, you know, that's an amazing opportunity for those brands. And it's different from, say, uh, you know, a, a brand putting a, a, um, a logo on a, on a jersey, right? Or, some, or purchasing some sort of signage, right? Where you see it, it has exposure. You know, I'm not certainly not a marketing or sponsorship professional. Um, you, of course, would know more about that than I do. But, um, you know, it's, it's different when you really get to have that hands-on, interactive, play with friends, play competitively using the equipment that you are considering buying, right? I think that's like a super interesting uh, sort of concept altogether. But you, you, you highlighted something and I haven't even touched on it yet is that in, in the mix of, of uh, offerings in the arena, we do, you, you, you said it um, great. We, we do also have a, a retail presence and it's, and it's not insignificant. It's, it's, you, you wouldn't say it's a, it's not a, um, you know, a Best Buy huge assortment, but, but it is a, um, it is a very curated assortment um, around the, the key uh, equipment, the, the games, the apparel, um, all of that um, um, is a big part of the proposition. And, and to you know, back to serving the consumer, we think that is a, a really big part of it. The fact that once you're in the arena, you see the, how, how great of an experience it is playing on a PlayStation 5 or, or on a Omen by HP or with the HyperX headset and, and, and keyboard and, and mice, we, we want the consumers to have ready access to, to that, that and immediate access to that kind of equipment. So um, obviously it makes sense. This notion of experiential marketing is a big part of, of that, that proposition as well. The, the, the consumer um, you know, fulfilling for consumer interest and, and demand right there on the spot. So, um, so really a big part of it. I, you know, we've, we've had some, uh, uh, great uh, some of the merch does selling the you know the apparel the team apparel not only the not only the belong team apparel but also the pro team apparel we had a our first o opening our weekend in houston outlaws we sold out of all their their gear it's something that they've they've not really ever had sustained presence for their their team merch and it's a team merch is a big part of of every team's um uh, mix they it's a branding opportunity it's a revenue opportunity um, and it's a, and it's something fans want. They want to be able to to wear and to exhibit um, who it is they're they're cheering for and who they're rooting for. And and uh, so the retail piece is a is a big part of that. Thanks for um, I, I I didn't didn't broach that in at all. But that is a big part of the consumer the consumer proposition that we're uh, that we're all about. Yeah, no sweat. It's it's definitely something that I personally found interesting, and um, you know, again, ha happy to have your your sort of insights and take on that. And that's a that's a good point about the um, the merchandise as well, because again, I'm not some sort of retail psychologist or anything. I don't know, but I know that when I see something in front of me that I can buy, it's different than you know, it's just online in the store, right? It's, oh yeah. Uh, it's a yeah. different sort of effect, and you're more a little bit more keen to purchase it. So it's cool that you know that's another point, uh, I guess, towards like how you guys are supporting teams. Obviously you mentioned that again, but that's just a little bit more sort of insight and clarity into that. So yep. you know, appreciate, yep. appreciate the insights there. Um, and uh, so we're, we're sort of winding down on time here. I, I forgot to let everyone know to ask questions in the beginning, but we did get to, so I will, uh, Wim, if, you, if you're okay with it, I'll fire these two questions at you. That's as long as they're not embarrassing to me, then I'm fine answering them. <laughs> They, and they may what be the embarrassing. What, what hair products do you use? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you that afterwards privately. Oh, but, um, so the, fir the first one here, we have why and how did Houston become the first belong to open stateside? Strategic, logistical decision, bit of both, question mark. 
And then also, Wim, what's your favorite UK belong team name? My okay, well that I'll answer the second one first. The Manchester Swarm <laughs> is one of my my favorite. I'm assuming you mean belong team name, right? Yeah, the Manchester Swarm. Mm -hmm. For most people, and this this is actually a great illustration of how these team names come to be. I didn't know that in Manchester beekeeping is a thing. If you're if you uh, evidently uh, on a pro rata basis, there are more bee owner keepers in Manchester than there are with the rest of the planet. And um, and so the Manchester Swarm, you know, that's again evoking some of that local uh, legacy and and local heritage. Um, that became that became the name um, of the. And I also like I really do like London Lionhearts. It's just so so British. Um, it's it's it, it's great. It's a great it's a great one. We have we have some. I can't reveal too much. We have some great names upcoming for the U.S. arenas. Uh, and just to just to hark on that a bit. Um, all of these are our trademark. You know, every every one of these we go we go through. We we actually do go through a rigorous process to make sure we can trademark them. I want to do a coffee table book of all the team logos at some point. That would be a cool thing for us to to do. But um, so that answered that question. And the first question again. Sorry, Cody. What was what was the first question? To <laughs> yeah, it was why and how did Houston become the first belong? Oh yeah, thank you, Which thank you, thank you for that. Yeah. Point. Well, it's it's a, it's a funny um, question, and and it's it's we are finding this in this in this pandemic era. Um, uh, we've we have we have uh, I I won't cite the number because it is rather confidential, but we have many 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 leases um, being reviewed um, as we speak, and and part of part of it is in this pandemic time, it's been tough to get through. Um, Things like zoning and and uh, and build outs and and building permits and all those kind of things. It's just the as with everything, um, it's 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 there's been delays. There's been um, all, all sorts of obstacles to to get an arena open. And and it, as it turned out, Texas is a is a key market for us. There's no question. Um, we were looking at Texas as uh, one of the first and, and foremost. There's a great legacy, obviously, in Texas for for esports and traditional sports for that matter. Um, but but it was it wasn't necessarily all serendipity, but the timing of which if had we gotten through, uh, had we gotten through Dallas uh, earlier, that might have been the first one. These were always somewhat coincidental. But but uh, the, mm -hmm. the complexities of getting an arena um, uh, uh, built built out from the from the white box, getting it up and operating um, that has been a bit of impact by the pandemic and and slowly coming back, but but Houston um, what couldn't have been a better first market for us. We're in a we're in a, um, a, a and one one other small um, a background piece here is when we go into a market, um, we won't have just a single arena. We will have multiple arenas. We will be building a footprint that starts as a as a neighborhood at the neighborhood level, community level, but then builds regionally. And then the power of, of our network knitting all these not only local communities together into regions, but then these regions knitted together uh, nationally and with the with UK and other international expansion we're planning. These can actually be international um, activations and and um, and networks together. But so in Houston, our first one is a smaller arena. We, we on average, these will be around uh, the 10,000 foot uh, square feet size. Some will be as large as 15,000 square feet, some as small as four to 5,000 square feet uh, pair land in Houston's on the smaller side. So um, so it was uh, it was a, a, a really a, a, a it was a it was a target, but it was also somewhat opportunistic. We could get uh, Houston up and going uh, before anything else. So um, it was a good, great question. And um, we, we we're so thrilled with the reception we're having in Houston. Um, and we and we we think the location we're going into Dallas is is even even better in Grapevine just in terms of density and mm -hmm. adjacencies and all the other other uh, facets that that make a um, bring bring all the programming to life. Yeah, very 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 interesting. And and somewhere in there you mentioned something about complexities, and that sort of rang a bell in my head. And of course you took you took a nod to the esports legacy and in in, um, in Texas, right? And you've got complexity gaming you've got the houston outlaws you have envy gaming who you have a partnership with so that you know that texas i think is a is a is a very interesting market um to go into and a, and a very smart one um as you said 
Well, we, we don't we don't think you know there we think every market has huge potential for for esports in the way that we're doing it in the way that we're bringing um, access for communities for neighborhoods. Um, you know, you referenced it, Cody. No different than the local baseball uh, diamond that I went and hung out with when I was twelve. Um, those don't exist in in esports, and what we we do think um, with, with some science behind them that we'll have. Um, the the right markets and the right locations for uh, uh, for for all of our arenas. Indeed, yeah, it's a it's a it's a really really um, really really cool proposition that you have. And I'm gonna I'm gonna ask one more question, Wim. And um, there's no surprise that this one has come from my friend Carrie, who sees a journalist at Esports Insider for for you and those who are listening that don't know. Um, but this will be our last for the evening, just to be mindful of those uh, across the pond and. If I can get this tab open, I'll finally ask you. But Carrie asks, what considerations of culture go into developing Belong as an international brand, cutting its teeth in the UK and expanding through the US and beyond? Well, that's a that's a, another, I, I haven't met Carrie, but uh, uh, Carrie, it's a great question. Um, one thing we, we didn't really talk about and, and hopefully is somewhat emblematic by by virtue of our the, the name of the company is that the word belong is really what we we stand for. It's it's we we are um, as as we as you build a community, as you give um, and and access to to gamers, you we we want to be as inclusive and as accessible as possible. That that means embracing. Um, diversity um, in every form and fashion, culturally, economically, uh, racially, uh, societally, um, all of all of those things, and and that is a big part of the culture that that we we not only um, want to foster, but the one that that we think is so important to to building. Um, and it's you know what it's and it's also good business. Um, um, we we think it's the right thing to, to do first and foremost, but number two is um, we we by giving um, um, equal access and, and accessibility uh, to 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 our gamers to our targets um, we, that is a big part of what we stand for the culture that we want to um, engender that not only in the arenas but within our industry and and hopefully we're we're making creating a, a good example uh for that we've done a lot we made a couple big announcements with the game hers uh to help women in gaming i just spoke at a uh a big gala that's supporting uh girls and called git girls in tech um to bring more um uh, uh women into into gaming and, and esports uh, um but we, i did a lot of work um in my former realm and continuing to bring it forth with the hbcus um and at the collegiate level, um, we started a, a HBCU league when I was part of CSL, and there's all, all of those great relationships that I was able to um, develop there, bringing forward into belong as we build arenas in the in the markets where HBCUs are big will be a big target uh, uh, and support uh, uh, mechanism um, from from us. So so I, I we we have seen you know the belong uh, brand take take um you know uh take hold in in the the uk we think that's a it's a this notion of in, inclusivity is a universal message it's something that will transcend and, and play um well uh what in whatever market whatever city whatever community we 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 um we get into so that is a that is a big part and and carrie it's a great way I, it was another uh, good point that I missed. Uh, belonging brand and what we do, what we stand for, um, is is a, an important mandate uh, for us. And and frankly, um, even at the Vindex and esports uh, engine uh, level, esports engine, our sister company, also really important uh, mantras and and um, messaging for for w w what we what we all believe. Yeah, excellent, excellent question, Carrie, and thank you, Wim, so much for answering it. You know, in inclusivity and diversity, and um, you know, it's it's something that's certainly near and dear to me, and I know cer certainly that's uh, important to a lot of people in this industry, and something that it, it quite frankly needs right now, it needs more of. Um, so, really love that that you and Belong and the team are sort of living by their their own name and brand and legacy. I think that's very interesting. Um, 
But I think with that being said, we're, we're up out of time. We've gone a little bit over and could probably talk for a little bit longer, Wim. It's been great to have you and um, I really appreciate Thanks, you coming Cody. on. I appreciate everyone that's uh, stopped by to listen. And um, make sure to tune into ESI Digital Summer tomorrow for another round of, of excellent programming. And thanks to the, uh, the fine folks uh, over there for putting on this show and having us today. So with that being said, thanks. we'll... Uh, thanks to ESI. Cody, thank you. Great, great uh, moderating as usual. Thank you so much, Wim. It's a pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for viewing. Nice.